Welcome everybody, why don't we get started? For those of you new to the uh, UNBC campus and terrorists, welcome. And no, this is not our usual arrangement. Uh, we were warned that, uh, that this is such a popular topic or our <laughs> guest speakers are so well networked in the community that we would have you know, 40, 50 or excess number of people here breaking the fire code. So uh, the, the, the theater uh, arrangement is, is not necessarily permanent. But if you haven't been here before, this is one in a series of uh, bi-weekly public presentations we like to host on uh, topics related to uh, community interest, to uh, research, to uh, uh, topical issues of the day. Uh, I hope you'll join us a uh, few weeks from now when uh, Rod Link, the uh, editor and publisher of our local newspaper, will talk to us about something about making sausages. I think he says that's what goes into the newspaper business. <laughs> Please join us in, in two weeks. Uh, today we are very pleased to have a, a couple of our own faculty members here. Uh, Amy Klepitar is the uh, regional coordinator for the nursing program here at uh, UNBC Northwest. Um, her partner, Matt Beadle, is a recent PhD graduate from UNBC in glaciology, and he's also an instructor in uh, physical geography and uh, uh, people in the environment courses uh, at Northwest Community College and also uh, one of our, our courses here. So uh, these individuals you may have seen around town on their bicycles in all kinds of weather. In fact, over the last few years, even all year round in the snow. They've taken their bicycling to new heights with a bit of a uh, round the world tour, which they're going to share with us today. Amy and Matt. Thank you, Phil. Thanks, Phil. And thank you guys all for coming. Yeah. Um, so we want to show you some slides today, tell some stories from the road. But we also want to hear from you what questions you have. If you're thinking of doing your own bike tour, feel free to ask questions about what we used or how did we have the kids along and those kinds of things. Um, we picked photos that mainly told stories that we could think of that might be interesting to you. Um, so I hope you enjoy. And then we don't have any time constraints, so I'll just say right now, if folks need to get up and leave at any point, feel, feel free. After the hour is over, we do have a couple short videos that Matt's compiled from our year, um, so we'll probably show them at the end if people want to stay. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing I wanted to point out is that our outfits today, we wore our old clothes that we had with us all year. So we each had one pair of pants with us all year. And these are them. They stood the test of time. One pair of cycling shoes, so that's why the... Our shoes are not... <laughs> the, the condition of the shoes is not as good, but... Um. They became a source of pride, though. We wanted to kind of nurse them along and get them, see them to the finish line. Yeah, and actually, this is the second shirt I went through, but when we reached the Patagonia flagship store in Ventura, California, on our travels, I heard they had a really good return policy, so I went in with my literally <laughs> held together by threads shirt, and I said, you have a good return policy. This shirt isn't looking so good. <laughs> so I literally took the disgusting oh. shirt off my back and picked one off the rack and off I went. <laughs> I'm not going to say they'll do it for everyone, but it was it was really a nice day for me to get a, a brand new shirt for free. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, well, something I wanted to talk about before we start with the photos is sort of the how, because lots of people ask us, how did you do this? And I I detect a little bit of an undercurrent of like financially how did you do this because we were mostly living on one income for the five years leading up to this trip Matt was a grad student um, and mainly we just had this in our vision for a long time and we saved no TV no cell phone we had one car we didn't really drive it um, we had rules we didn't go out to eat really for a couple years we only bought a bottle of wine if like someone really special is coming over <laughs> those kinds of things, and we just saved money. Um, it helped that the rental market was very good, so we were able to rent our house out, and we wanted our home rental income to pay for the mortgage, home insurance, and um, taxes. And so that pretty much was even, and then we just lived simply on the road. We camped, I don't know how many days? 160 nights last year we camped. So most of the nights we were on the road we camped, and a lot of those nights that we were camping, we were in South America, at least, we were wild camping, which means we just pulled off to the side of the road and put our tent up when we saw a stream. Um, and we ate simply. We had 
uh, probably 200 bowls of pasta <laughs> last, last year. We're really glad to be back and eating a variety of foods. Um, but just those sorts of things. So I'll just get that, that piece out of the way at the beginning before we start. And then the bigger picture, um, we, we knew we had a year. We rented our house for a year, so we knew we couldn't come back to our house for 12 months. That was the main kind of constraining thing. Um, we had a few reservations planned. Uh, so we had a ticket, there are direct flights from Whitehorse to Frankfurt, Germany in the summer. So we capitalized on that. We had a ticket to Frankfurt. And then we also had a ticket four months later from Rome uh, to Bariloche, Argentina. And other than that, we didn't have any plans. We didn't know how long we wanted to stay in South America or where we'd go after that. We knew we wanted to have some exposure to Spanish for our two boys and also for us. Um, and other than arriving in Frankfurt and having a bit of time with Amy's family in the Czech Republic, we didn't really know where we were going to go in, in Europe either. So, and we wanted it to be that way so we could learn on the road from other travelers and figure out where the best way to go was. But uh, this is how things kind of wound up. Um, we, the first bit, you'll see us going to Whitehorse, flying to Frankfurt four months in Europe. I um, wound up being five months in South America, mostly the Patagonian region, so north and then back south. And then we had three months left, and we rode up the, most of the Pacific coast of the US. That's what you're going to see. That's the big thing. And so that last piece, actually, the Pacific Coast of the U.S., that wasn't in our original plans. We thought we might come home and spend time with family in Alaska and New York, where we're from, but we just weren't ready to stop riding in March, so yeah. we kept going. <laughs> so this is us before kids. This is actually our honeymoon when we biked around Iceland. This has became our thank you note for gifts from our wedding. And so this is just to show that we were bike tourists before. It wasn't that we had kids and got this crazy notion that we should drive around the planet. We had kids and we had a few interesting kind of false starts. So this is one time down in Ferry Island, a very short distance bike tour, uh, <laughs> where Liam wound up screaming his head off the younger one. And Amy and he bailed to our house at 11, right before the gates closed on Ferry Island. And Lee Finley and I camped. And anyway, so we had some. Failed attempts, some other, uh, this was out to Lake, Lake Else Lake. Lake. Yeah, so just some bike overnights to test. Um, this is the crew, this is us too. Uh, and then our older son, Finley. Uh, and then our uh, younger son, Liam. So we've used a variety of methods of carrying kids and gear over the years, as you can see. And you'll see what we ended up deciding upon for our big trip later. This, this is a visit from a family from Germany. We host people uh, through an organization called warmshowers.org. And it's similar to couch surfing, if anyone knows what that is. And we invite people who are on their bicycles to come stay with us. This is a family that was particularly uh, memorable to us. And um, to go back. <coughs> uh, they were memorable to us because they arrived with a less than one year old uh, in tow. And they had started in Alaska. And we kept following their blog as they made their way all the way down to the southern tip of South America. So these, this couple had planned on doing this huge, it's called the Pan America Bike Tour. And then um, they found out they were pregnant. And they said, well, Germany gives us two months of maternity leave. Let's just do it anyway. And so they started when their daughter was? 11 months. 11 months. And finished when she was a three, a little over three. No. That's so this is the father that. and their daughter, Rania. And they were, they were really inspirational in terms of kicking us out the door and saying, wow, you can, you can do this as a family. This is the sort of lead up bike tour to see if all of our systems work. So we went to Haida Gwaii uh, the summer before we left on our big trip. And, and there's sunshine every day. We so did long. 10 days in Haida Gwaii, so we, and that was successful, so we thought, sure, year, why not? <laughs> <laughs> um, this is everything, pretty much. Other than our bikes and our kids and our trailers, this is what we brought. Uh, helmets, we each had two pairs of shoes, sleeping bags, everything for camping. This is all camping gear tent, uh, my clothing, boy's clothing, uh, repair nice. kit, first aid kit, uh, school supplies and a few toys for the kids. Um, and we acquired some more things along the way. In fact, if you want to, you can browse our table of random detritus that we picked up <laughs> along the, the way. They were sticks treasures. and uh, yeah, Legos, things they traded with other people. Um, so our, our loads became much bigger than this and much dirtier than this along the way. A couple things we had with us for technology, we had one iPad and we mostly kept in touch with family by a couple different means. One is this website and we found that we didn't really have a ton of time. So if any of you were following along, you noticed that, wow, they're not really posting a whole lot. 
what's the deal? We, it's hard to find time to put up pictures on a website, especially if you're in a place where Wi-Fi isn't super reliable. But this is still online if you're interested in finding more information about where we went and what we did. Uh, it's called one family's journeys, uh, dot wordpress dot com. There are also links to our videos and stuff on here if you want to have a look. Uh, another uh, piece of technology we used was uh, an app on our iPad called Track My Tour. And this was our way to kind of post really quick updates to our family to show our parents that we hadn't killed their grandkids yet. Um, the day to day, and it was super easy to use. So that's up there, it's called trackmytour.com. You take a photo, you attach it, uh, the app automatically attacks, attaches it to the map. So you can see where you are, and then as soon as you have internet, um, we had an iPad with cellular, so we use cellular sometimes or Wi-Fi, and it uploads it. So you can track track your tour, as the name implies. And this is another one, if, if you are a bike tour, um, we learned about this when we got to Germany. It was really handy in Europe especially, where navigation was a challenge. Uh, it's called maps.me, and it's linked to the GPS on the iPad. And it was ridiculously precise, where you could count the number of stairs in a town. So we were looking at a route of how to go through, say, Prague and say, okay, we want to avoid stairs, but look, there's eight <laughs> stairs there, so we need to go this way. Anyway, a really handy app if, if you're a cycle tourist. And it's completely offline, which is nice. Yes. This is an example of searching for camping, so it just highlights all the camping spots in the area. Right. So this is us. The first bit, we left from Terrace, and we went to my parents, my hometown of Juneau, Alaska, and this is really where we started riding. This is where I grew up in Juneau. The one thing I like about this picture is how shiny and clean and kind of naive we look. <laughs> and, uh, how unprepared perhaps we are. This is the same shirt, it's a little faded, the hat's a little faded. And we were, physically we were pretty unprepared. We just, we worked right up until when we left, so we didn't do any training. I think we got on our bikes loaded up with whatever heavy stuff we could put in them, maybe once, and we were astounded at how hard it was. <laughs> Thankfully Matt knew. For, he said, you know, I think we really should lower the gearing on our bikes, and I'm, we really would not have, I would not have been able to pedal without that changing to the gearing to make them lower. So this is the setup, our two touring bikes, and then we have these trailers called Weehoos for the kids, and they're kind of cool in that the, they're in a re little recumbent type seat where they can relax, they even took a nap a few times, but they also have pedals that can contribute. And it does help, especially Finley, if he was pedaling hard on a flat, he could actually push the entire thing along at a slope. So we worked our way up to Whitehorse by the ferry and the railroad up and over to Carcross and then biked just for a couple days to Whitehorse. And then we packed everything up into three bike boxes and some carried on panniers and three bike boxes? Yeah, three bike boxes and we flew directly to Frankfurt, Germany and it was pretty crazy going from this tiny little airport to this busiest airport in Europe. Um, but it was wonderful to arrive in a place where the cycling infrastructure was so well set up for, for safe riding. This was handy and this is my dad. My parents actually accompanied us to Whitehorse to see us off and so we had him there to help us take apart everything and my mom was actually inside the airport entertaining the kids and even then it probably took two to three hours to break everything apart and get it ready and at that point we're kind of thinking, gosh, how are we going to set everything back up in Frankfurt with the kids running around and do this again once we get to Rome. Anyway, figured it out. Um, and so then we flew to Frankfurt. And so the next bit you'll see is this kind of wacky S-shaped thing we did. So we didn't have all of this planned out. I, I sort of spent my free time in the months leading up to our leaving looking at um, a website called biketours.com. And this is a nice, fancy, guided bike tour website. But I pilfered their itineraries to see where it might be fun for us. Um, and so I had about the first three weeks mapped out until we got to Vienna, where we were going to meet with my family and ride with them to Prague. Um, and so we had mapped it so that we stayed on these beautiful paths that are all in river valleys. So you're riding through these gorgeous mountains, but you're just uh, going at a gradual downhill the whole time. Uh -huh. Wonderful. So we trained from Frankfurt to Innsbruck and started riding in Innsbruck. The first bit you see is this is just uh, outside of Innsbruck through the mountain valley. So you're in the Alps, but it's flat. Beautiful riding on dedicated bike paths. Fresh croissants every morning, good <laughs> coffee. It was <laughs> deluxe bike tour. Yeah. Yeah. Very a nice, nice way to start, certainly. <laughs> good camping. Lots of bakery stops. This is on a wet day, dodging some rain. Lots of good yeah, chances to have some good treats. 
We, we realized earlier on that the, the little fenders that come with the trailers are, were not sufficient. Um, thankfully, the boys were troopers. This is Liam on the first rainy day. We realized, okay, we're riding through the rain and they're just getting utterly splattered. Um, what we did, and you'll see a photo later on, we took one of these, we had a plastic foldable plate thing, and we, we cut it and used a bunch of electrical tape and taped a larger fender on the parent's fender that then blocked all the spray, which worked fine. But then we didn't have any plates to eat off of, so we each had one bowl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, on this picture, I want to talk a bit about our pace. Um, so we were traveling at their pace. If they weren't happy, we weren't happy. And for the entire year, we biked about 210 days or so, and we averaged roughly 40 kilometers per day. And if you're a bike tourist, you'll know that 40 kilometers a day isn't, that's not a whole lot. Um, we were moving slowly and we were riding on average maybe three, three and a half hours a day. Stopping at tons of playgrounds and castles, uh, any place to play, stop to check out a slug. Um, and so we were moving really slowly. But once we got used to that pace, it was fine. It, was, it became how we moved. That was just kind of our rhythm and it wasn't really a problem to us. Sometimes though, travelers would, would come along with us and be like, oh, they're fun, we should ride with them for a while. But of course we were at such a slow pace that they didn't want to hang out with us. So <laughs> we felt like we were abandoned sometimes by this really cool community that we wanted to ride with. But, uh, but it was kind of nice sometimes because everyone was passing us and sometimes they'd talk about the crazy family that they had seen a few miles back. So often we would enter a town and people were like, oh, we heard about you. <laughs> We've been hearing about you. Yeah, we're still, we're still making our way to the town. But it, was, it, it worked out pretty well for us because we received some invitations to stay with people who had heard about us coming down the road. Really nice. Great thing about bike touring is eating as much as you want. <laughs> and there's lots of it in Europe, all over the place. <laughs> Europe is amazing how it's set up for bike touring. Everyone bike, bike tours in Europe. It's really easy. If you want to start cycle touring, Europe is a great place to start. So this um, is just after Vienna when my family had met up with us. So this is my brother and his wife. And uh, we followed a, a kind of famous bike route from Vienna to Prague called the Prague Greenways. Very well laid out, very well mapped. And the best thing is there were fruit trees growing along the sides of almost every path and road we were on. So we picked, throughout the summer, we picked apricots, cherries, plums, uh, yeah, any fruit you can imagine. We, yeah. We thought it was free, so we picked and ate it. We thought it was for us, so we saved it. And again, gorgeous riding. This is north of Vienna, heading towards the Czech border with Amy's. This is Amy's mom and Amy's dad up here, and Amy's brother and his wife. It was neat to go through agricultural seasons and watch things grow. And then once we went to South America, we, we, we hopped hemispheres and hopped seasons and got to see the whole thing again in the southern hemisphere. <laughs> so for the boys, it was cool to stop and explore wheat and poppies, break open the poppies and see what's inside. And lots of cool agricultural things to watch. Stopping and watching combines was a favorite activity. Mm -hmm. Just up here at the top of the hills, the border with the Czech Republic. Mm -hmm. yeah. And one of the main reasons for coming into the Czech Republic is Amy's family is, is Czech, and we love relatives in Prague, so we're heading to Prague for a bit of a reunion with Amy's family. You recognize that shirt? <laughs> Here it is. <laughs> <It's> still alive. <laughs> so um, this story has to do, let's see, my brother had a bike mechanical. We were stopped at a playground, as usual, and he was working on it, and uh, this was in Slovakia? Southern Czech Republic. Southern Czech Republic. Um, and from across the street, there was a pub slash grocery store. I guess every grocery store is slash pub in some parts <laughs> of the world. <laughs> but these people were yelling at us, and uh, my brother's girlfriend was like, I think they're angry at us. I don't think we're supposed to be stopped here. And I speak just a little bit of Czech, and I said, no, they're, they're talking something about a drink. I'm pretty sure they want us to come over and have a drink with them. <laughs> Can't be, it's only 11 o'clock. <laughs> sure enough, so we found this, this was the first of many instances where we ended up doing sort of like welcome shots with people. Um, and there wasn't a whole lot of common language in most of these instances, but doing a shot of homemade flugelwitze or some kind of vodka was, was really a, a nice experience for us as long as we didn't have like more than one and tried to ride our bikes. And the boys love this one because they got chocolate covered donuts as well. 
route finding in the Czech Republic. This is our first thousand kilometers. We were pretty <laughs> proud to top thousand K. Still looking clean. Yeah. <laughs> and then we got to Prague, and we actually spent nearly two weeks in Prague, uh, a town, a city where Amy spent a fair bit of time and spent time with family exploring the city. And from there, uh, we headed north. This is actually back in Germany. So we continued north from Prague back up into Germany. And this is in Pirna near Dresden. And this is staying with the warm showers, warm showers hosts um, in Dresden. And from here, we didn't really know where we were going. They suggested this Spree Radweg, or Spree River um, cycle route <coughs> in eastern Germany. It was, it was a wonderful. Lots of camping. This is what it looks like camping. Oftentimes, we were the only people in tents, lots of RV uh, campers. And also, we like this photo because it shows how feral we sort of became. <laughs> like we, we, we're still in transition, but we kind of talked about how we, when we came back, we needed societal reintegration lessons, <laughs> like eating with our hands. We weren't showering very often. Um, yeah, we only had spoons with us, which was kind of funny because now we're all relearning how to use forks. But there were certain kind of noodles that worked better with spoons. We found out, and spaghetti wasn't one. Again, wonderful riding. Um, little to no traffic. This part of, the, uh, of Eastern Germany, um, lots of rivers and lakes and canals, and it's known for its canoe culture, so it was really neat to stop and take a break and do a little canoeing as well. So this the fellow in the yellow, you may recognize him. That's Gregor, who was in one of the very first photographs. So this doesn't happen very often with warm showers, but we did, we did a true exchange with this family, and that was one of the reasons we wanted to head to Berlin, because they had then finished their tour by then, and we went and stayed with them, which was a very neat way to kind of close that circle. Now they've just had their second and are planning a bike tour for next year. <laughs> um, but they had this really neat bike. I don't know if anyone's seen these before. These are Dutch bikes called... Buckfeets. Buckfeets, and it's like a wheelbarrow bike. But it's amazingly easy to ride and steer, and you can fit yeah up to four kids and your groceries in it. Very, very good. So from here, um, you'll notice that we were going in the wrong direction. We had to get to Rome. Uh, that was where our ticket was, and we were heading continuing north. Um, and so we didn't really know where to go from here. We had to head back south. We didn't know which way to go. We were looking at tickets to get us maybe back to Vienna and then start riding south. Um, but everyone was going on their holiday about this time as well, so all the trains were filled. We could wait in Berlin for seven days, ten days to get on a train, or the only ticket we could do was uh, we could get a train ticket to Poland. So we thought, okay, let's go to Poland. So Amy got on biketours.com, Bike Tours Direct again, and said, oh, there's this cool Amber Trails Greenway that takes you from Krakow, uh, Krakow down to Budapest. I um, said, so, okay, let's give it a go. So we went to Krakow. So this is us just arrived off the train in Krakow and that map that Matt showed the previous slide looks wonderful but in reality the uh, amber trail was not very easy to find so we ended up to leave Krakow we used something we didn't use very often and that was uh, Google Maps bicycle directions and there's a little note at the bottom that says note Google Maps bicycle directions are in beta and so we found out quickly what that meant is that <laughs> this is what it meant. <laughs> And then so there was this for a long time. We were jumping up over the weeds to try to see, like, is there a river over there? Because if there is, we're going the right way. And then we, had, we came to this huge train overpass with, like, I don't know. 60 stairs. 60 stairs. And we had to take apart. We have to take apart the trailers to get up the steps, take off all the panniers, schlep each piece up, and then, again, down. So... But we made it through, we did, we, we did find the road eventually, and made it out of Krakow. This was the following day, exploring this beautiful church. And at this point, again, we were still following Google Maps, trying to, we didn't know really where this Amber Greenway was. And then just across the street, there was this sign <laughs> for the uh, Amber Trail. Uh, and so we'd stumbled upon it, and great signage. We didn't know this existed. Um, there was funding from this, funding for this, maybe 10, 20 years ago, and it's kind of fallen by the wayside, but this gorgeous cycle route. Um, through southern Poland and into Slovakia. And this is what the marks look like that we were looking for on the trees that marked the route. So that next day, we stumbled upon um, something in Poland. It's a quite a Catholic country. And um, it was the Feast of the Assumption. And we were just cycling through these paths or part of the Amber Trail, but they were also part of a Catholic pil pilgrimage. So we, we crossed paths with all of these pilgrims, chanting, singing, uh, praying. 
and uh, they they all had candy with them. And when they saw <laughs> my kids, he looked stunned. He's like, I don't know what happened. These singing people just came towards me, kissed me on my cheeks, and now I've got fistfuls of candy. <laughs> so they loved it. <laughs> and it was pretty neat for us, too, to see One such of the most neat. memorable cultural right. things to stumble upon the whole year. This yeah, beautiful display of devotion, community, wonderful people. A couple of spots in the amber trail were a little rough. <laughs> Most of it was pretty good. Um, this is now into Slovakia. Uh, <laughs> there actually were tank rides. You could take tank rides. We didn't, we didn't do tank rides, but the sign was pretty cool. Um, and at this point, you're getting down. So this is on the border of Poland and Slovakia, the Tatra Mountains. And this were these are the biggest climbs of the year, the steepest climbs of the year. You're on these gorgeous farm paths to avoid the more major roads that are in the river valleys. Um, those ones are flat. These ones are quiet but steep. And at all costs, we avoid the busy highways. Um, but uh, they led uphill. So that's an interesting, it reminds me of a point that a lot of people would give us advice and they would think, and maybe not being cyclists, they would think that we would want the flattest route because well, that's the easiest. But like Matt said, we avoided busyness at all costs and technically or typically the flat routes were the busy highways and the not flat went over the hills. And but we much preferred the climbing and the quiet roads. So we learned not really to trust anyone else's opinions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, interestingly, there, there are a lot of campgrounds that were in order within the last five years in Poland and Slovakia, um, but they've all been closed. So a lot of them were listed on our maps and we biked there and there was no campground. And so we actually wound up staying in hotels quite a bit. Thankfully, they weren't too expensive. But they didn't like us using our camp stove. This was one of the more challenging days of the year. So we, we, we stumbled upon this amazing goulash festival where it, it was this competition to see who could make the best goulash. Gorged ourselves, had a great time. And the next town, it had advertised on our little app. It said, oh, there's a grocery store, and there's a campground, and there's a little hotel, there's a pizza restaurant. You know, something is going to be open. We showed up. None of that was open. Uh, this giant thunderstorm rolled in. So we're hiding in a bus stop, thinking, OK, what are we going to do? It's 12K to the next town. We decided, OK, let's go for it. We'll try to get to the next town. But it started getting dark. And we pulled over in this farm field in the middle of Slovakia stumbled our way down into this kind of area between the two fields. And really wild camping isn't, it's kind of frowned upon in a lot of European countries. In some places like Denmark and Sweden and Norway, it's, it's your right to camp on public land. There just aren't a lot of places because population density is so high. We didn't have a lot of food, so dinner this night was chocolate, granola, and a can of garbanzo beans. <laughs> and we realized part of this was really cool, um, seeing the boys' personalities. And Finley is such a trooper in these challenging times. Maybe this positivity comes out of him whenever it was in the hardest time, which was really cool. So super memorable. So he loved the night we had chocolate granola. <laughs> <laughs> and we all just got to eat it out of the pot. That's awesome. <laughs> and of course, we woke up the next morning. It had rained all night. And slogging out of our lower farm field campsite, we had, you know, like a big clump of, clump of mud on your shoe. We could barely walk. And it took nearly an hour to scrape all the mud off, off the bike bikes. tires to be able to roll again. <laughs> Anyway, it worked out. Uh, for a whole, a whole year, we saw two other families biking. And this was a family. They've been on the road for a few years. Their son, who's in the chariot here, he was actually born in New Zealand. They stopped biking for four months, had their son. He got a little old, and they kept on going. They were they're Swiss. They were almost home. So Slovakia, no spots to stop. It turns out it's actually pretty easy to roll these. <laughs> This is in Hungary. A lot of the campgrounds they had, the boys called these tractor bikes. So we'd show up, we'd set up camp, and the boys would race around on a little bike. Most of the camping in Europe was, I guess, what they would call glamping. Like there was Wi Fi, maybe a swimming pool. pool. We were usually one of the only tents, and I know that can happen a lot in Canada as well. But um, it, it was not at all set up for tents. The pad was usually cement. Um, we had very few toys this year. One of the cool things was just to see the boys' creativity. And they started by making these bug houses. So they actually found some bugs, and they made, got some grass, and made a bug house. So they were really proud of a bug house they created. So <laughs> just to see their, I don't know, creativity was something really cool, not having many toys. This is another time random strangers just saw us, gave us a shot, and <laughs> invited us in. We were having kind of a low day. It was cold and rainy. We'd stopped to play soccer in a field. And this man came down from his apartment. He had seen us and uh, just 
Get they brought us the croissants, brought us and, croissants and tea. And, nice. and the the requisite stuff. homemade liqueur. Yeah. Uh, this is in the hill country of southern Slovenia, probably one of our favorite places. After leaving Europe, we said if we were going to go back and spend another month, it would all be in Slovenia. Gorgeous, gorgeous place. Steep hills again. So at this point, uh, we're getting to what, late August? Maybe early, early September, September, and all of a sudden, it felt like we weren't just on holidays. We were like outlasting all the holiday people. This is the camp so campground. We're the only ones in the campground. Um, and we sort of felt a little bit strange being on the road, like, wow, we can't go back to Terrace. Everyone else has gone back to school and, and work, and the summer's over. Um, and now it just changed from holidays to traveling. We are now officially nomads. We were. We were nomads. Um, it turned out to be one of the wettest, rainiest sum, uh, summers in Europe. This is in Croatia. It was actually terrible flooding in Croatia. We were actually glad because if, if it was a typical hot, dry summer in Europe, we may well have melted. So we'd much rather to prefer to deal with the rain. But there was some flooding uh, in Croatia. Uh, we hold up. This is in a hostel. There's zip lines the boys made for their toys. <laughs> hold up in a hostel for a couple of days, wait for the torrential rains, and we actually wound up taking a train to hop over to the coast of Croatia to escape the flooding. Mm -hmm. So this is the coast of Croatia. This is a much more popular area for uh, folks to vacation. The center of Croatia, we found that the infrastructure wasn't really um, directed towards um, vacationers so much, but we loved it. It was very authentic and rustic. Um, but on the coast, you get there all of a sudden, and it's tons of folks from all over Europe who are, are vacationing there. And it became summer again, so it was Mediterranean climate. This is one of the most beautiful campsites of the year. Those are olive trees. It smelled like rosemary and olives and all the other nice things that are growing there. The genetic seas right there. And the cyclists get the, the campsites right down at the at the water's edge. Which was really the tragedy cool. of this was we only stayed one night. So <laughs> <laughs> we, we moved ridiculously slowly, but uh, my only regrets for the year are why didn't we slow down more? Why didn't we not stay in this place longer? Mm -hmm. Typical breakfast. More riding along the coast of Croatia. This part of uh, Croatia, it's kind of neat. It's called the Dalmatian Coast, so you can hop on the islands, off the islands. We did a lot of riding. I, I was in my mind imagining it was going to be really flat, but it <laughs> completely wasn't. I think we had one hill that was 12 kilometers long. And we just thought, we just got off the, the ferry. How could it be so hilly? And, uh, but it was challenging in a good way, and, and there were a lot of rewards. This was uh, our second uh, wild camping experience in in Europe, and this was sort of right behind this gated, fancy community in Croatia. Again, the campground that was on our map didn't materialize, so we just kind of told everyone to be really quiet. We snuck in and put up our tent when it was just dusk, um, and then snuck around a little bit. It was a bit challenging, but uh, it's crazy. we're all having fun. Uh, this is in Diocletian's palace, I think, in Split, so a little bit of exploring old uh, historical towns in Croatia. Um, before we caught a ferry across um, across the Adriatic to Italy. We had hoped to have time to bike up and over the boot to Rome before we had to catch our flight, but we ran out of time. And so we caught a, a train up and over to Rome, and we had one day to do a little bus tour around Rome with the boys before we flew out. Um, we were given a gift. We actually met up with my host family. I did a short exchange when I was in high school with a family in Italy. They came to meet us and gave us this one kilogram jar of Nutella. Uh, we did our best to consume it in about two and a half days. We couldn't quite do it, and the tragedy was that we brought it to the airport and uh, it got confiscated. You can't bring Nutella on an airplane. Not your carry on. Not your our last day in Europe, the boys with the Ferrari shirts on, so excited to see a Ferrari in the airport. <laughs> and their cuteness <laughs> swayed the ladies at the checking counter not to charge us at all for our bikes. Oh, it's actually yeah. funny, like the only time we were charged was the very last flight that we took from Portland to Alaska. Portland to Alaska <laughs> to home. They're just, the Americans were not up for, they didn't. They don't care about cute smiles. So then <laughs> we, we switched hemispheres, and we had a ticket into this town, San Carlos de Bariloche in Argentina. So that's where we'll start. From there, we, we spent a month here in Bariloche uh, taking Spanish lessons and waiting for the weather to warm up. And then we ride to the north, across the border into Chile, and then down south, south, south Chile, back into Argentina, a little exploration down here. 
the airport after setting up all the bikes. And then this is where we, this is Bariloche. This is up on top of the mountain overlooking the town down here on this big lake, gorgeous mountains of the Andes. And this ended up being a good place to spend a month. Well, the Spanish school was there, which was great, but there were tons of hikes for kids. Um, we stayed with a family as part of our um, the language lessons. We tried to enroll our kids in school, but they, they were so used to just being with us 24-7. They That coupled with a whole new language that they don't understand, that it, that it didn't work. As soon as we got to South America, I started to realize a lot of these parallels with us here in North America, a lot of similar issues. And so this is a this is one of the um, European colonials. I don't know exactly who this is. One of you may. Um, but, and this is um, stenciled on afterwards, assassino or assassin. Um, so it's very similar kind of first people's issues and colonial powers. And we start to see a lot of the, as we move south, you'll see some more images talking about hydroelectric power generation and fisheries and things that are mirror images of what uh, issues that we have here in the north, which is very interesting. It's Halloween last year. <laughs> they don't really <laughs> celebrate it there, but. We made some we friends didn't. and told them about it and said, hey, the kids will come over, so give them some chocolate. <laughs> 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 they did, that was great. Well, one of our favorite traditions that we picked up in South America was drinking mate. It's like a, a tea that you um, put into a gourd and then you sip it with a straw with a filter on the bottom. And so every day we started carrying a thermos with us, like all of the Argentinos that live there and a lot of folks in Paraguay and Uruguay. And it's, um, it helped us warm up and it was a nice reason for a stop during the day. And the coffee's terrible down the there, so <laughs> this is a nice alternative. Everyone drinks Nescafe pretty much, especially in Chile. Oh, yeah. We stayed, this kind of became our second home. This is called the Alaska Hostel actually snowed the day after Halloween, um, so we were glad we waited for the weather to warm up a bit. And this, we stumbled upon this family, um, Trevor and Charlotte Gavura, they live in Golden, and their two kids, their two girls, they lived in Bariloche for the year. We just stumbled upon them, the kids became fast friends, and that was really awesome to spend time with them. So the day we left Bariloche was probably one of our most difficult riding days of the year. Um, we had heard from many people about the Patagonian winds, um, and this was this was the day we got the worst of it. Ironically, it was our first day of riding. We learned, we, we learned we, to avoid it. <laughs> we learned to avoid it, and thankfully, it, it didn't get worse than that. But the picture behind me is we are we're riding in the ditch. The the road is about thirty feet over in this picture, and the people behind us are friends of a motorcyclist that has gotten blown off the road, literally blown away, 30 feet off the road. And uh, I was leaning as much as I could to actually keep the, buck, the bike upright, but we were just falling over multiple times. We've got such a wide uh, profile to, from the side. Um, and then our route made us change directions to go directly into the wind, and we just couldn't move. Like, an the hour boys. after this was taken, we were cowering behind a couple of these little like scrub bushes. We were drinking mate and reading the boys a story, trying to calm down tears and thinking, okay, what are we going to do? We would have been crying if our kids weren't crying. <laughs> if they were crying, we had to not cry. In the, in the wrong direction, there was this line of trees, and we thought, okay, there's got to be some water there. We can get shelter behind the trees. So we biked over. Amy went up. It turned out it was this hacienda or farm, this gated farm. Uh, she rode the 2K up to ask if we could camp on their land, and they said, no, don't camp on our land, please, but please come stay with us and have dinner with us. Oh, nice. <laughs> so, bad day turned good day. We acquired more stuff, so this is our thermos with mate. Liam was still wearing <laughs> diapers at night. Uh, we acquired a soccer ball. So you'll notice from our earlier pictures, these panniers are growing with lots of treasures and stuff as well, some of which are on the back table if you want to peruse those afterward. So the, the, the road conditions in South America were definitely not the same as they were in Europe. I'd say the bike touring were, were pretty opposite in those two places as far as in terms of um, ease of bike touring there. But um, dust became an issue, so we all had these buffs, and we would do a, trucks are coming, buffs up, and we would all put our buffs up, and then we would do a countdown for when the air was sort of clear a little bit, and everybody could put them down. But we got used to that being part of our riding. This was the first crossing up and over the Andes. The Chilean border is right up here beneath this volcano. Um, gorgeous pass. You think crossing the Andes will be this harrowing climb, but it's this gorgeous long 60 kilometer gradual climb. Much, much easier than the Tatra Mountains of Southern Poland. And this was our first gravel hike-a-bike. We were worried about this gravel, these gravel sections. We didn't know if we could handle it with our heavy loads and also with skinny tires. 
I remember feeling pretty challenged and down at this point, thinking, wow, this riding in South America just might not work. We might have to bail. And I think one, one thing we learned is just slow way down. Our traction was an issue, so I ended up getting wider tires. Um, it wasn't always so bad that you had to walk, but yeah, gaining traction rather than the actual gearing um, was, the, was more of the issue. And our average speed of about 40K a day in Europe went down to about 30 in general in South America. We started in Chile in this uh, region of this lakes region, uh, famous rivers. for its fishing. Sorry, rivers. We were there a little before the tourist season, which was nice. Um, lots of cool amenities, but this was uh, pre-holidays, uh, so everyone was still in school and at work, so things were relatively quiet. So in South America, the food became more of a challenge. Um, for a lot of the riding we did, we were on this long 1,200 kilometer dirt road called the Carretera Austral. And, and the pace we were riding meant that we came to a town every about four or five days. Um, and what was there as far as food, um, it depended on when the truck had arrived. So they got a truck maybe every one week to two weeks, depending. And if we weren't there, there were no fruits, fresh fruits and vegetables there. So we would get down at the bottom of our food bag and we would have maybe one apple and one carrot for the four of us to share, but no one got scurvy, so I think we did okay, but our, our dinner rotations were instant mashed potatoes, pasta, rice, sometimes rice, and that's it. Repeat. And Liam didn't eat mashed potatoes, so he only had the two dinner rotation. He, had, he fasted on the third night. <laughs> <laughs> Boys got into route finding and really liking maps. Some of our maps are in the back tables. Yeah, as well. as well. Afterwards, if you want to peruse some of the maps we had with us, um, we did. We were able to ride with someone for one one part of the year, which was great. Anne Sophie from France was on a, a long distance bike tour, and she was having some knee knee troubles. So she said, oh, "I'll slow down and hang out with you guys." So we rode with Anne Sophie for about ten days, and it was wonderful. The boys were just thrilled to have another part of our crew. Uh, they totally glommed onto her and had a great. This is up, we did a little side trip up a valley uh, to go find these hot springs. We were told that they were rustic. More uh, rustic. Hot springs, and the, the ones in the bigger towns were definitely more of a like, spa treatment, and this yeah. was just a bunch of bathtubs in, in the rock. It was great. They were hot. An interesting place the next morning, luckily we were warned the night before, but we woke up to the Chilean military firing rockets and uh, machine gun practice. So they just- In the valley. In the so valley. Ricocheting off all yeah, the- Yeah, very the interesting. Mountains cultural experience. All the, all the military guys were driving their trucks out that road the next day and stopped and waved to the boys and the boys walked in. This is uh, Liam's birthday. He asked for smoked salmon and we're like, sorry honey, we just don't have smoked salmon. But a few days later, sure enough, on the side of the road, Salman Ahumado. So we went in, this guy's house, he smokes, catches his own and, and smokes his own salmon. He's also a taxidermist. So we got a tour of his taxidermy studio, got some wild, uh, some smoked salmon, and this was the wild boar, very dangerous, <laughs> that the boys wanted their picture taken with. So we didn't encounter any actual wild boar. This is the, just what the lakes and rivers districts of Chile looks like. Uh, Chile also, we realized that we started calling it kind of the land of the barbed wire fence and we felt kind of hemmed into the roadways. Everything is barbed wire, there are lots of sheep farms and cattle farms. Um, and so we have oftentimes had, um, we called it a bus stop lunch. So this is Liam inside a bus stop. We'd stop at a bus stop because there'd be a little bench, a roof over our head if it was raining. Power lunch. More volcanoes. Two volcanoes we biked under actually erupted uh, within the six months after we left. One of them quite catastrophically. Mm -hmm. Um, this actually is a sequence showing the road conditions, the variability of roads. So we had some, some areas that were really nice roads, good shoulder, or a little bit of a shoulder. Um, getting bumpier, still rideable. Uh, construction, <laughs> steep uphill, not rideable. And then just... You couldn't even push your bike on Yeah, just really. utterly ridiculous. Um, then another construction zone. Luckily this was only a kilometer and a half or so of pushing through this stuff. This is just one of the great playgrounds. We probably visited 150, 175 playgrounds this year, but the safety standards in South America were totally different than anywhere else. <laughs> 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 really good slides. 
This is the second family we met uh, for during the year, a French family. They had been bike touring in South America for eight months, I think, or all told, they spent eight months. And they had some interesting setups. So they had a tandem with them. So their older child rode sometimes on the tandem. They also had a chariot and they had a bike seat strapped on the back of the mom's bike. And we had used one of those in Haida Gwaii. Um, they said they really didn't use it much just for gear. Um, on the bumpy roads, I can't imagine it would have been very comfortable. For and the then their kids had three options of spots to go and hang out. So then we, we cycled south of Puerto Montt down to the coast and we were wild camping on this beach uh, waiting for the ferry to take us over this island called uh, Isla Chiloé, Chiloé Island. So on the boat. Um, political demonstration. Actually, no, these people are protesting that they don't have a municipal water supply where they live. Mm -hmm. We were one of the few people to get past this protest and get out to where they had these penguin tours. They kind of took pity on the kids and said, oh yeah, they can go see the penguins. So we're the only people with this huge infrastructure set up for penguin viewing. Usually they have thousands of people and we were the only ones there. So we got to go see the penguins. And then on uh, Isla Chiloé, there's also this famous dish called Caranto, which you, you, you cook seafood and meat and buns in this pit of hot rocks. You cover it all with these big leaves that look kind of like uh, rhubarb leaves. And then with sod, you let it sit for an hour. So interesting cultural dish. More ferry time. This is transferring us to the start of this famous route called the Carretera Austral. So the Carretera Austral is um, a part of the riding that we had heard of from a lot of people who had stayed with us or when we followed their blogs. And it, it, it's a kind of a, become a mecca for bicy bicycle tourists because there's very little traffic. It's essentially a 1,200 kilometer dead end road in southern Chile. Um, so only people who would live down there or who want to do a uh, out and back trip would go there. The Chilean government has settled these little villages that are along it about every 150 kilometers just because that part of the world is the land claims are a little contentious between Argentina and Chile. So they've, they're they essentially paying people to live down there. Hmm. This is what a lot of our campsites look like on the Caratara Austral. The side of the road, it was free. Sometimes hard to find a spot for your tent though. And lots of barbed wire. Very low riding conditions. <laughs> Some of the spots you might stop with kids, this was just a nice gravel pile and said, oh, that looks awesome. Let's stop there. We've got to jump around on the gravel pile for a while. Yeah, so in this section, definitely no playgrounds, castles, yeah. little cafes, or anything like that. It was wilderness almost the whole way. But it was really neat, small little towns at the head of fjords, very reminiscent of coastal BC or southeast Alaska. This is up and over a pass. Uh, even though this was summer, this was this was actually Christmas Eve last year, going up and over a pass. It was summer down there, uh, but quite cold. It was nearly snowing. Um, this is Christmas Eve last year. We have our decorated bike, celebrated with a little bottle of wine and a pasta dish. Santa Claus found the boys' uh, stockings hung in the vestibule. <laughs> So uh, in one of the larger towns we, we stayed in, on the Carretera, we overheard some folks uh, speaking English, and we start, struck up a conversation with them, and they're from Montana. They invited us to stay at their cabin. So they are fishing guides, and they spend the summer down in Patagonia and the summer in North America up here, up in Montana, but they also sometimes guide um, in the Kispiox. Anyway, we stayed there for New Year's in their rustic cabin and uh, had a nice, lovely New Year's. This is, oh yeah, this photo is what we would typically shop for and carry with us to when get we us were on this section of road. We would depend on that for five days. That was five days for us mm -hmm. to get to the next resupply. Uh, most dry riders would do that in two days. We were taking four to five. Mm -hmm. That's kind of fun. <laughs> down, that we got to go down that. Not <laughs> <laughs> so for that reason, ride the Carretera from north to south. Just that, Just that one. Uh, another another image showing kind of the similar issues. This is uh, Patagonia Sin represses is Patagonia without dams, no dams in Patagonia. So lots of proposed hydro development. Um, very similar dynamic <coughs> if you have power development in these rural communities powering uh, the larger urban centers. In this case, the urban centers are to the north, or for us it's to the south. Just more food consumed <laughs> on, when you're on a bike ride. So we would pull into a town if there was an opportunity for non-pasta food, we would yeah. usually splurge. Uh, this is what the landscape looks like 
gorgeous valleys, uh, big mountains, very similar to here. But no big animals, which was kind of neat. It was neat for camping reasons, because camping with kids, it's hard to be as clean as you probably should be with, a, with bears in the area. But luckily, we saw lots of big flies and a, a one birds. fox and some birds the entire time. We were a bit of an anomaly on the road, so this would happen numerous times a day. People would stop and just come. They'd give candy to the boys and chat with us. We were this weird novelty. Or they would slow down and we'd see an iPhone coming out the, the window. <laughs> like We kind of felt like we were animals on a safari sometimes. <laughs> we accumulated toys. We didn't start the trip with these, so our panniers are ballooning with time, and mostly it's things the boys accumulated. These were Christmas presents. Stopping to wait out some rain, more Lego time. <laughs> more challenging roads. So the word for dirt road is ripio in Spanish, and so we then got all these variations. This was steepio. <laughs> Steep ripio. This was a favorite campsite of mine just because it was, it was so crazy to get down to. We, we wanted to camp always by water sources. Uh, the water source was way down the steep embankment, but there's no place to put our bikes. Actually, no, we couldn't get our bikes down the steep embankment, so we kind of built a portal edge for our bikes and uh, scurried down the slope and put our uh, tent right by the water. These are some of the large critters that we saw in Patagonia. Um, these are Wanakos, but it was interesting to have this massive wilderness like we have here and very few large animals like we have. They're very interesting, very different. Um, this was a treasure of Finley's. This is just an old plastic jar, and he planted a plant in it. And it became a, an important item. And one morning we woke up and we packed up and left. We get a couple of K down the road and realize, uh oh, we didn't, we don't have Finley's plant, and it was a tragedy. Um, so of course we pulled over. I biked back, got found the plant, biked back. So your your definition of essentials changes when you're traveling <laughs> with kids. <laughs> More camping. This is just a. a quote unquote campground, but it's mostly sheep there. Farm. Yeah, sheep farm. And we but ate dinner inside the barn where they had skinned and hung the sheep. And we hung our wet gear to dry next to these sheep skins as well, an open fire here. Uh, really wonderful. Lots of travelers that we met along the road. There were some days where we actually encountered more cycling tourists than we did cars. Some days we would only have a handful of cars pass us, which was especially as we got farther and farther south and there were no settlements down there. This is an interesting settlement called Coleta Tortel, uh, coastal fjord town, no roads. It's all, they have tens of kilometers of boardwalk all around the town. And then the very last section of the character, there's a short uh, ferry that you have to take to connect to the- The last 100 kilometers or so of road. And that last 100 kilometers felt almost like a hiking trail. There was hardly any traffic. It, when the ferry would come, there'd be maybe three or four cars and then it would be nothing for hours. Uh, I like this picture just to illustrate how dirty we all were. So the South America portion of our trip, like I said, we were wild camping a lot. When we did pull into an actual designated campsite, uh, the water was wood heated. So they would say, oh, tell us two hours before you want to have a shower. And usually we wouldn't pull in until 5 o'clock. So our kids bathed so rarely in that section. Really, all of us did. But And then no opportunities to wash clothes other than, you know, streams or um, sinks here and there. But we were so dirty. When I would rinse out the boys' clothes, it would, I would be rinsing 20 times and it would still be muddy water. <laughs> but we were healthy. We were happy. This is the town at the end of the road, of the end of Carretera Austral. Uh, Vio Higgins, it's called. Uh, people receive a government subsidy to live there and kind of occupy this, what's, what was more contested land with Argentina. We even decided to drag a stick around town. <laughs> There's lots of beautiful infrastructure in the town, but no one really lives there. Very few people live there. It's kind of a strange place. And then this is the end, the official end of the Carretera Shell. We said it's a dead end road, and it's a dead end if you don't, if you're not traveling on foot or by bicycle. And so what you can do to connect to the other side is take a ferry. These are other cycle tourists that were doing the same thing um, across this lake, and then it's 22 kilometers. Maybe seven of it was rideable for us. And the last six uh, is this. Uh, it took us, it's six kilometers it took us all day to do, um, to shuttle everything down. And you get up to the pass, and there's just a sign to get, you know, so that you're crossing back into Argentina. And you actually go through the border once you reach the bottom of the pass on the other side. Yeah, so then you come down this trail here, and down to the lake, 
catch another boat, and then the start of the road system started from the opposite side of this lake in Argentina. So that's how cyclists or hikers use this as a through. But if you have a vehicle, you can't yeah. go through. And then the last 33 kilometers into the first town to El Chaltén. Um, I think we call this type of repio disappointio or something like that. <laughs> it was just horribly rough. You we really wanted to get town. where you wanted to go. We had a big meal. Um, and this is uh, in the shadow of Mount Fitzroy, just stunning peaks uh, near this area. Famous for its hiking and climbing. I like this picture of Liam. It just kind of shows his cockpit with an old uh, <laughs> toys and sticks and strings and shells. Uh, this is filled with quote unquote treasures, bottle caps, whatever he finds, mm -hmm. things he accumulate. We took a couple days off, in, off of our bikes in El Chaltén and we did some hiking together as a family. You can go stay up high. So we packed up and rented some hiking gear and, and stayed up at one of the free campsites in the mountains. Just gorgeous. And from here, it wouldn't be possible to ride further south, and people do. Um, but you're getting into the eastern side of the Andes, really windy, um, big distances between water and between places to stay. And with the distances we were covering, um, we opted to stop cycling at this point. Um, we had a few weeks left before our flight, uh, a little further south in a town called El Calafate. And so we did some more um, just kind of Patagonian tourist things. We went back into Chile further south. We traveled by bus. We left our bikes at a campground. Torres del Valle. Yep. So we took a short tour in there. Um, this is down in Punta Arenas, amazing museum that does replicas of famous boats. This is Ernest Shackle, replica of Ernest Shackleton's James Caird, the boat they, the eight men took across to get across the Strait of Georgia. Um, yeah, and so from there, we have. Uh, so it, it's one o'clock, just so folks know. That's the end of the South America section. We do have one more section if, if folks want to stay. I think maybe we'll just keep talking for a little while, but. It's about pray. 10 or 12 images, I think, yeah. of the last section. So we weren't ready to get uh, to finish riding yet. It was March, we had to go somewhere warm, so we flew into San Diego and started biking north. Mm -hmm. Oops, that one's out of order. This is also in South America, doing some gaucho action. And in San Diego, my parents met us. So this is my mom and my dad and we started riding north uh, from San Diego. One of the neat things that riding with Matt's mom gave us was she's an artist, so everybody had their sketchbooks, and well, whenever we stopped, the artwork came out, and uh, it became a tradition for the rest of our trip, which is really nice. So now we have a whole whole books of images that they've all created from that part of our trip. A family we stayed with in Los Angeles. It's nice. Here and there, even if it wasn't warm showers, we got invited in to stay with folks, which we, we really loved seeing a glimpse of, of people's lives. Culture, we'll just say that culture changed, obviously, yeah. going from <laughs> Patagonia to yeah. Southern California. In theory, there different. would have been beautiful views of the Pacific Ocean during this stretch, <laughs> but couldn't really see because there are too many big RVs lined up. But interesting culture as well, the American West. This was a campground that was on our map. So also back there are some examples of the maps we followed in North America. They're put out by the Adventure Cycling Association. They're fantastic. They have hill profiles. They have distances between campgrounds. Um, they have all the amenities cyclists might, might want, where you can find internet, water, camping. And one thing we did notice, though, the camping didn't include cost. So this was a, I guess, California-style campground. We pulled up there, it was a long, twisty road uphill to the campsite, we were exhausted. Um, I, I think it wasn't just Matt and I, we would have just wild camped, but it was $95 per campsite. Per no children were allowed <laughs> under age six. Uh, only two people were allowed per campsite. Oh so they pulled a lot of strings and let, let us camp. We were allowed uh, to camp we were allowed there. To camp. And uh, anyway, yeah, we would have left probably, but my mom and, parent, my mom and dad were done. They are like, we're done, we'll foot the bill. Um, <laughs> So anyway. But they did have an all-you-could-eat breakfast buffet, and I'm just going to say that we ate. We ate 95. This is the coast of California, the famous Big Sur. Um, challenging riding with hills, but also with respect to traffic um, and uh, roads. We were always on the, the inside edge. Thank goodness. I think it would have been a little terrified at times if we were on the outside edge. With the Everyone told us we were going the wrong direction. Everyone rides this from north to south because of prevailing winds. Um, we never really, we had a few days of bad winds, but in general, we kind of liked being on the inside of the road instead of the mm -hmm. left side of the road. 
amazing opportunities to stop at aquariums. So really cool things for the boys. Stopping at beaches, this is at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Yeah, that's a really nice section of, of road, whether you're on bikes or not, for kids. It's a ton this to is do. near Salinas, California, which is actually where my mom's family was. So we met up with some of her family and an area where she visited a lot as a kid and her mother grew up. And once again, we got to see the agricultural season, so the third in one year. <laughs> This is coming into San Francisco, turning up a famed steep climb in San Francisco. This is the Pacific Coast Bicycle Trail. <coughs> this is just an idea of what our home looked like for most of the year. And it was funny because the, the type of tent we have, we don't have any windows looking out. And so sometimes the boys would look at us and say, I forgot where we are. Because of course the inside of our tent looks exactly the same. <laughs> um, and also reminds me of our routine. So packing up camp and setting up camp took a large portion of every day, but it became a really nice routine. The boys would get out their schoolwork or their notebooks, they would do some artwork or they would play, and we would kind of do the nice unpacking, fluffing the pillow. I'm the only one that had a pillow with us, but uh, <laughs> setting out our home for the night and then packing it up again. This was a neat experience. This is San Francisco, um, but we're on Angel Island. If anyone's been in the Bay Area, there are about eight campsites on Angel Island. And when the last boat leaves for the day, it's you and the people in seven other campsites on this big island. And the uh, sun goes down and the lights of the city come up and you're in this kind of wilderness setting looking out on the big metropolis. Pretty mm -hmm. memorable spot. Of course, we had to show a picture of the Golden Gate Bridge. Amy's parents actually joined us in San Francisco and rode again with us, so about 10 days north. Um, Liam got really into maps. This same map is actually in the back, and he got really into looking at the hill profile. And we had this big climb coming called, we called it the Leggett Climb, because it went up and over to Leggett. And every day, we'd go up a hill, and I was like, is this it? Is this, is this Leggett? Leggett? <laughs> so we'd stop, and he'd look at, okay, how far are we from the big climb? Mm -hmm. Coastal Oregon was really a pleasure to ride along. Lots of beaches. Riding um, through the redwood riding forest. through the redwoods. <laughs> um, a couple mechanical things all year, not nothing really major. This bar that connects, this is the original bar. Um, it got a little bit bent, and so Finley's trailer was a little bit askew. And so WeHu, the company, sent us a free new bar in Eureka, California. But we, of course, couldn't get rid of the old one because it had all of Finley's stickers that he had accumulated. <laughs> <laughs> so we just zap strapped it on there, and after your towing, so my rig, including my weight and Finley's weight, was 400 pounds. Wow. Amy's was 300. And so when, you're, when you've got that much, what's an extra five pounds? <laughs> I would not have brought it along. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of beach time. All up the south, or up the, excuse me, the Pacific coast at most of the campsites, there are these hiker bicycle campsites. And it's $5 per person. We paid for the adults. So most nights it was $10 per night, so relatively inexpensive. It's really nice to see, though, that there's an effort made to attract or at least an acknowledgement that there are lots of people on bicycles or hiking through. Some of the places had these food lockers. You would put your food in, and in the back of the food locker was a USB charging station, uh, solar panels on top. There was a bike stand on the side of it. Really well set up for people um, coming through by bicycle. This was one of the headwind sections where, coupled with the headwind and the climb, we had to do a bit of hiking along the coast. I think you rode it. I think I had to hike. <laughs> Tillamook Cheese Factory. Getting our fair sh or uh, our samples. money's worth at the uh, free tour. <laughs> so this was my only f only flat of the trip, and it was a good one. Like that screw went all the way through to the rim, but it happened two weeks before the end of our trip. So oh. I was pretty happy with my Schwalbe's. That uh, you didn't lasted. get any other flats. No other flat tires. Wow. Nothing to do with me. Just <laughs> good tires. But isn't that amazing? amazing? And then we came. We ended it. We ended up in Portland. And a couple days before this, uh, we were along Cannon Beach taking a break. And this guy comes down. He says, "Hey, I recognize your bike. You got the same bike as me." And we got to chatting. And uh, he's a famous author. Uh, Joe Kermaski. We have a couple of his books about bicycle books. touring. He's like, hey, I'm Joe Kermaski. I'm like, we know that name. Anyway, uh, he's done these big bike tours with his family, and uh, they invited us to stay at their house. So this is us at one of the food truck zones in Portland having dinner together. And it was a really fitting end to the year uh, with him and his family. Uh, the <laughs> last I, day of riding into Portland. <laughs> I was in charge of navigation the last day, and uh, somehow we ended up accidentally climbing the 
largest hill in Portland <laughs> yeah. before descending. So the food truck feast was even just more justified because we had made our way up here instead of just going through the river valley into Portland. So. And then this is getting bite boxes for the last time in Portland with friends of ours that we stayed with in Portland. Um, and then we flew home to Juneau. This is in Juneau. Um, this is a thank you card we made and sent to people we met along the way during the year. Uh, we spent about a month with my family in Alaska. We spent a month with Amy's family in New York before we came back to Terrace. Uh, we'll stop there. I have to thank you guys with the, with the UNBC bug. You know, let you decide whose office it stays in. But thank you for sharing your adventures with us. And I understand if people have questions or you want to show your videos, or, yeah, we have the room. We're not pressing.